Parsha's Balak has 104 verses. It doesn't have any mitzvos, and the entirety of the Parsha is a narrative, namely the narrative of very unusual, very interesting characters that are trying to curse the Jewish people. Now, it's very interesting that with the exception of the final nine verses, the entire Parsha is presented from the vantage point, from the perspective of the enemies of the Jewish people. And I don't think, with the exception maybe of a few verses at the beginning of Exodus, I don't think that we have a parallel to this where the perspective of the Torah, of the narrative, is not from the Jewish people, but instead from the perspective of their enemies. So it's very unusual that we have this whole story, a whole parsha, based upon following the story of Bilaam and Balak as they're scheming to try to curse and to try to destroy the Jewish people. Now, just as a way of introduction, the central character of the parsha is Bilaam or Balaam, and he's a very unusual character in Jewish literature. So, for example, the Talmud in the book of Sanhedrin tells us that all Jewish people have a portion in Olam Abba, have a portion in the afterlife in the world to come. And then it lists several exceptions. There are people who, by dint of their character, their behavior, their, their deeds, their sins, they lose their portion of Abba, they forfeit their portion in the afterlife. So it lists people, people who don't believe in the Torah, people who don't believe in, in the afterlife itself, people who are heretics. And then it lists individuals that also have lost their portion. And it lists uh, several famous sinners amongst the Jewish people. And it also lists Bilaam. Now, it's a little bit unusual because the structure of that Mishnah, of that teaching of the Talmud, is that all Jews have a portion of the Abba, have a portion of the world to come. And these are the Jews that are the exceptions to the rule that they lose their portion in Olam Abba. Now, Bilaam, of course, he's the prophet from the non-Jews. And therefore, you would never think from the beginning of the Mishnah that he would have a portion in the world to come. And therefore, it's a little bit odd that we're told that he loses his portion. Moreover, there is a uh, an intimate connection between Bilaam, the greatest of the prophets of the non-Jews, and Abraham, of course, the founder, the patriarch of our nation. The Mishnah tells us in the end of Perkyavos, whoever has these three characteristics is a student of Abraham, and whoever has these three other characteristics is a student of Bilaam, the wicked one. If you have a good eye, if you have a humble spirit, if you're content, you have a limited appetite for physical things, then you're a student of Abraham. Whereas if you have an evil eye, a haughty spirit, a rapacious appetite, then you are a student of Bilaam the wicked. It's almost as if we're told there's three hallmarks of the students of Abraham, and the opposite of those three are the characteristics of the students of Bilaam. And the commentaries note that Bilaam, in effect, these three characteristics, they include all the negative character that exists. And the three positive characteristics found in Abraham include all the positive characteristics that exist. So I think from the unusual treatment that we're getting of Bilaam in this Parsha and throughout Jewish literature, it seems like there's an emphasis to study this individual character almost as if he is the perfect example of the worst kind of person you could be, and therefore we're studying his story and we're given an entire parsha from his perspective because we need to study how exactly to not behave. We have to dwell a little bit on the character that's the exact opposite of Abraham. We have to learn what are the characteristics that would make a person forfeit their portion in Olam Abba, the portion in the afterlife. So the parsha begins, Balak, the son of Tzipor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. In the end of last week's parsha, we had the beginning of the battles the Jewish people had on the eastern bank of the Jordan River, and they destroyed the Amorites. And now Balak, who is the king of Moab, one of the other nations that resides on the eastern bank of the Jordan, now they're worried. Moab became very frightened of the people because it was numerous. Commentaries note that Sihon and Od, the two mighty kings that were destroyed last week's parsha, were very, very strong, and now we have Moab, who is comparatively smaller and weaker, and they are very nervous because if the mighty empires were decimated by the Jews, certainly the more smaller and weaker ones are increasingly vulnerable. 
and therefore they resorted, as we'll see in the parsha, to unconventional warfare. And Moab was disgusted in the face of the children of Israel. It is interesting that this is the second time in the Torah that we see the people are disgusted by the Jews. It wasn't just over here. It was also when the Egyptians, when they hatched their plan to enslave the Jewish people, it says the same exact word. They were disgusted. And I think this really describes maybe the sentiment that undergirds anti-Semitism. Rashi tells us here, what does it mean they were disgusted? It means they lost their meaning in life. They were so agitated. They had such an irrational loathing, abhorring of the Jewish people that they couldn't live with themselves. They couldn't bear existing so long as the Jewish people were alive. And again, it seems like from last week's parsha that the Jews always reach out with overtures of peace. There's an easy solution to the, the dilemma. You approach the Jewish people and you say, okay, I'm interested in coming to some sort of term, some sort of agreement. Let's have a an agreement that we could both live by and let's have peace. That That's the easy solution. But here we see that they're motivated by this irrational, unusual loathing. They couldn't live. They couldn't exist. They lost their meaning in life so long as the Jewish people were around. So what did they do? Moab said to the elders of Midian, now the congregation, i.e. the Jewish people, will lick up our entire surroundings as an ox licks up the greening of the field, and Balak, the son of Tzipor, was king of Moab at that time. And Rashi tells us that Moab and Midian were long-time enemies, but they united against the common enemy, even though they themselves hated each other, but because they both hated the Jews as well, they found a way to create a pact. Talmud tells us this is akin to two dogs that were fighting with each other. And one of them is attacked by a wolf. So what happens? The other dog comes to his aid. Because otherwise, if I don't help the dog now, even though I hate him, but the wolf will eat him and then he'll eat me next. Similarly here, Moab and Midian, these two enemies, because they have a common enemy, the Jewish people, they are uniting. Now, it's interesting, we find that Balak was the king of Moab at that time. Rashi tells us that really he was only recently appointed. He was like a wartime president. He was the interim president. It was only because they saw the Jewish people trouncing Sichon and Og, they appointed someone like Balak, someone who really was not previously in the monarchy. They appointed him. He was a necromancer, a sorcerer, even greater than Bilam. And therefore, they appointed him to be a very unusual figurehead because of the pressing needs of the arrival of the Jews. Now, it's interesting. The Midrash tells us that Balak was either the son or the grandson of Jethro, Moses' father-in-law. And it makes him, in effect, the brother-in-law or the nephew of Moses. It's an interesting family dynamics here. So we have a problem. The Jewish people are coming and Moab is reaching out to the elders of Midian. Why is Moab reaching out to the elders of Midian, not to the king of Midian, not to the ministers of Midian? Why to the elders of Midian? So the Ramban quotes a Midrash that tells us something very fascinating. We know Moses, as a young child, had to escape from Egypt and eventually ends up in the land of Midian, this very same land. And of course, he marries the daughter of Jethro, Tsipora, and he spends a lot of time there until he's 80 when he goes back to Egypt to save the Jewish people. And therefore, the Midrash tells us that the reason why they went to the elders of Midian is because they wanted to do some field research. They realized that the leader of the Jewish people was raised in Midian, and therefore it is appropriate for us to send messengers to the elders of Midian, not to the kings, not to the nation, because the elders of Midian would know the backstory, the history of Moses, his vulnerabilities, his powers, and therefore we'll find out how to thwart the Jews and Moses. And Rashi tells us that they discovered that the power of the nation resides in its words, and therefore, we will attack them with words. As Jewish people, our power lies in the voice, is the voice of Jacob. It's in our words, in the words of prayer, in the words of Torah. 
And therefore, the way to undo that, the way to attack that, the kryptonite, so to speak, of the Jewish people, is words, and therefore they hired Bilaam, the sorcerer, to use words to curse the Jewish people. So he sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Baor, to Pesor, which is where he was, which is by the river, and we're going to summon Bilaam to go curse the Jewish people. And, and the message was as follows, Behold, a people has come out of Egypt. Behold, it has covered the surface of the earth. It sits opposite me. The commentaries note that it sits opposite me that Balak and the Moabites did not know exactly where they were. And like we spoke about last week, the Jewish people were enveloped with the clouds that made them invisible so that they knew that the enemy was there. They didn't know exactly where it was. So now, please come and curse this people for me, for it is too powerful for me. Perhaps I will be able to strike it and drive it from the land, for I know that whomever you bless is blessed, and whomever, and whomever you curse is accursed. So there's a few interesting things over here. Rashi tells us right away at the very beginning an interesting idea. Bilaam is a prophet who has apparently the ability to curse and to bless. And the question that Rashi asks is, why does someone like Bilaam, and we'll learn more about him, someone who is crowned with all the terrible characteristics that exist in the world, why is someone like that given prophecy? Isn't prophecy the domain of the righteous, of the people that are upstanding, the people that are the greatest of the human species? Why is a sinner, a Gentile like Bilaam, someone like that, why is he given this tremendous power, this ability to communicate with God, this ability to ostensibly have blessing and curses? So Rashi tells us that the reason why Bilaam was given prophecy is so that there should not be an excuse for the nations in the future. The nations will say, oh, the Jewish people are given all this reward and we're suffering, but it's not fair. They had someone like Moses and Moses made sure that they were behaving in the proper way. Had we had prophets equal or greater to Moses, we too have, would have been morally upstanding. And therefore, the non-Jews had to have a character as great, as talented as Moses, or else it would not be fair. And therefore, they were given Bilaam, who was someone who equaled or exceeded Moses in prophecy. And what happened? We see that their prophet not only did not improve their standing, the prophet actually caused terrible sins, not only for the Jewish people, as we'll see later in the Parsha, but also for the non-Jews. And therefore, we see it didn't really work out as planned. That's the idea that we find in Rashi. The, the Gentiles had to have someone, they had to have a prophet, and they got Bilaam, someone who had the goods, had the ability to be greater than Moses, but ended up being terribly immoral. And the obvious question on this idea is, if you have to give prophecy to the non-Jews, or else they have an excuse, shouldn't you give it to someone who's more decent, someone who's more moral? Why are you giving it to someone as corrupt as morally suspect as Bilaam? And the answer perhaps is that Bilaam is someone is given, who is given prophecy because otherwise there's an excuse. He didn't acquire it. He didn't earn it. It was gifted to him. And we see an idea here that unearned greatness is not transformational. If you don't earn the stature that you attain, it's actually going to be harmful rather than helpful for you. So, for example, on a national scale, the Jewish people experience the Sinai revelation, a prophecy on a national scale, something that hitherto and thenceforth has not happened, they achieved the peak of human experience. Did they earn it? Was it gifted? Was it something that they acquired or was it something that was foisted upon them, that was given to them? They did not acquire their greatness. It was gifted to them. So what happened immediately following that, they have the capacity to sin, of course, with the golden calf. And we see an idea. What you struggle to attain, what you sweat and you earn, that purifies you, that refines you. But when you have something which is given to you, not only does it not refine you, it is likely to corrupt you yet further. Bilaam was given this stature, this prophecy as a gift, and it corrupted him rather than refining him. 
That's one idea that we see over here. Alternatively, there is a general principle that any greatness that someone has necessarily leads to haughtiness unless you choose to embrace humility. And we have a concept in, in Jewish philosophy that the greater stature someone unlocks, someone obtains, the commensurate step in humility is necessary. So for example, when we pray in the Shemona Esra, in the Amidah prayer, you're supposed to bow down, you're supposed to kneel, so to speak, before God four times. If you have a high priest, of course, someone who achieves a very high stature amongst the Jewish people, the law states that he has to bow not just four times, but 19 times, one for each blessing. What about the king? The king who has achieved the pinnacle, the highest office, the greatest stature amongst the nation, the law states that he has to pray the entire prayer while bowing. Every stage that we unlock in our greatness must necessarily be accompanied by a parallel, a sister step in humility. Abraham had that. Abraham was someone that despite the fact that God gave him tremendous prophecy and tremendous love and closeness and promises and a great legacy, what did Abraham say? Anochi, Afar, Va'efer, I am but dust and ashes. He understood how to utilize the prophecy and not allow it to corrupt him. He earned it. Bilaam, on the other hand, it was gifted to him and he did not take those steps to ensure that each stage of greatness is accompanied by a commensurate or parallel stage in humility and therefore he became the most arrogant and the most haughty. Now it is interesting that Abraham, we're told about Abraham, I will bless those who bless you and those who curse you, I will curse. Abraham had the ability to do blessings and curses. And again, we see another parallel here between Abraham and Bilaam. Bilaam ostensibly, at least in the eyes of Balak, he is someone who people thought that he had the power to bless and to curse as well. Now, the Talmud tells us that the truth is that Bilaam only had one power. His power was that he was able to pinpoint the precise millisecond, the moment that God is, so to speak, angry and most susceptible, most agreeable to cursing, but he really did not have the ability to bless. But Balak, the king of of Moab, he thought that Bilaam had the ability to bless, but the truth was that Bilaam did not have the ability to bless. So how'd that work? How does Balak come under the impression that Bilaam knew how to bless when the truth was that he only knew how to curse. So the commentaries tell us something really interesting. They say that Bilaam had the vision of a prophet. He was able to, so to speak, see the future. But he wasn't able to manipulate the future only for the negative, not for the positive. So he saw in the future that Balak is going to be appointed as king of Moab. So he went over to Balak and he said, I want to give you a blessing. I'm going to bless you that you will be appointed king. And sure enough, subsequently, Balak is appointed king. And Balak attributed that to the blessing of Bilaam. But the truth is, is that Bilaam just foresaw it and made believe that he caused it, that he effectuated it only to be able to garner the, the honor and the, the residual benefits of Balak thinking that Bilaam really caused the blessing and didn't just try to seize the rewards of causing that. But the truth was that his only ability lied in his, in his capacity to curse, but not to bless. Okay, so Balak sent this message to Bilaam, please curse this Jewish people and you'll help me with my very pressing problem. So the elders of Moab, the elders of Midian, they, they come and they approach Bilaam and they make the request. And he says, I have to think about it overnight. I have to see what God is going to tell me. Rashi tells us that Bilaam had prophecy, yes, but it was only conveyed to him at night. God only went to him at night. God, so to speak, snuck away to go visit him, but it was never done during the day. And Rashi adds that the prophecy of Bilaam was only at night similar to Laban. In chapter 31 of Genesis, 
God came to Laban, the father-in-law of Jacob, in a dream at night. And it's interesting that Rashi makes this connection between Bilaam and Laban, because the Talmud tells us that Bilaam was actually the son of Laban. And according to at least one opinion in the Midrash, Bilaam is Laban. Of course, this would make him very old. But what it means is that there's some sort of spiritual connection between Bilaam and Laban, just like Laban tried to uproot everything, Bilaam is going to follow in his footsteps, try to uproot everything amongst the Jewish people. Now, Bilaam is asking the elders of Midian and Moab to stay overnight. Will God allow me to go with you? And Rashi explains that what does that mean? Will God allow me to go with you? Maybe God will only allow me to go with you if there's officers that are of greater stature than you. Maybe God will say, no, 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 these people who have come to ask for you to come curse the Jewish people, they're not respectable enough, they're not honorable enough, and therefore you can't go with them, you have to go with someone who's even more honorable. Again, we see his pride and his hubris and his haughtiness and his arrogance. So God came to Bilaam and asked him, who are these men with you? A very interesting question. God is testing Bilaam. He's asking the question, who are these men? Of course, God knows everything. And the notion of God asking Bilaam a question, when God certainly knows the answer, is is unusual. So Bilaam responded, Balak, the son of Tzipor, the king of Moab, sent to me. So it's interesting dialogue over here between God. God asks Bilaam, who are these men? And Bilaam responds, well, the king of Moab, Balak, son of Tipur, they sent to me. So the commentaries and the Midrash and our sages tell us a very interesting idea. There is a similar question that is asked of Cain in the beginning of Genesis. Cain, of course, is asked, where is your brother? God asked that question. Now, God, of course, knows the answer. And the obvious answer that Cain should have told God is, well, you don't need my help. You know the answer better than I do. Similarly, Bilaam should have said the same thing. Bilaam should have said, you don't need to know that. You know the, you don't need my help in figuring out and deciphering the situation. You know exactly who these people are better than I do. So the Midrash tells us that there's three people that God inspected them, God tested them, and he found them to be a pot of urine. That's the words of the Midrash. And they are Cain, Bilaam, and Chistia, the king of Judah. So it's interesting here that we see again that Bilaam is making a big blunder by answering the question improperly. He should have said to God, you know very well you don't need my help in this matter. But what does he respond? He responds, Balak, son of Tipur, king of Moab, sent to me. And again, Rashi tells us, and this is again the study of the Parsha. Part of the Parsha is to study exactly how corrupt someone could get and what not to do. And here we see more arrogance. The king of Moab, God, says Bilaam, you don't think I'm so special, but you know who does think I'm special? The king of Moab. They're interested in what I have to say, even though you're not. And continues, Bilaam, behold, the people coming out of, the, out of Egypt that cover the surface of the earth, now go and curse it for me. Perhaps I will be able to make war against them and drive it away. So what does God say to Bilaam? No, you can't go with them. You can't curse the people. The people is blessed. And Bilaam wakes up in the morning and tells the officers of Balak, go, Hashem has refused to give me permission to go with you. I have to go with someone who's more important. That's the insinuation. I need more people that are more important. So they return to Balak and they say, Bilaam does not want to come with us. So he sends higher ranking officers to go try to cajole and convince Bilaam to come curse the Jewish people. They return to Bilaam. They say, I'll honor you greatly. I'll give you tremendous wealth. And Bilaam responds, even if you give me your whole house full of silver and gold, I cannot transgress the word of Hashem, my God, to do anything, do anything small or great. And Rashi tells us again that this shows his unbridled avarice, his unsatiated, his rapacious desire that, yes, Balak really should Give me a house full of gold and silver. I really am deserving of all that wealth and all that honor. Again, he tells the messengers, let me wait overnight. Let me speak to God. Whatever God says to to do, I will do. And again, there's a conversation. God arrives to 
the prophecy with Bilaam at night, and he says to them, if the men came to summon you, arise and go with them, provided that the thing that I shall speak to you, you shall do. Our sages tell us that when someone is really deeply desirous of pursuing a certain path, the Almighty will facilitate that, the Almighty will enable that. If someone wants to become righteous, if someone wants to purify themselves, then God will facilitate that. If someone wants to become wicked, if someone wants to defile themselves, then God will facilitate that too. Bilaam is sincerely desirous of joining Balak and trying to curse the Jewish people. And God says, you know what? If that's what you want, I'm going to allow that. I'm going to enable that. I'm going to allow you to go. And I think this does provide us with a little bit of a scary idea. You know, sometimes if things are going swimmingly and it seems like we're having tremendous success in whatever we choose, we may be deluded into thinking that we're doing what's right. Because after all, God is enabling, God's facilitating me to do this. It must mean that the Almighty is happy with what I'm doing. I'm doing the right thing. But here we see that someone like Bill was doing the wrong thing. But because he's so deeply desirous of it, God allows it. And he may be under the impression that he's doing the right thing. But the truth is he's doing the wrong thing. I think it's a valuable lesson for us that we have to do what the Torah wants of us. We have to do what the Almighty wants of us. And just because we experience divine assistance, so to speak, or divine enabling of success in the path that we choose, that does not necessarily mean that we're doing the right thing. Okay, so Bilaam arose in the morning and he saddled his female donkey and he went with the officers of Moab. So if you read that verse quickly, you might not notice that there's something really unusual here. Verse 21, Bilaam arose in the morning and saddled his female donkey and went with the officers of Moab. The Torah, of course, does not give us anything that's not necessary. There's no extra fat. There's no information that we're inundated with unnecessarily. And Rashi right away tells us a very deep idea. In the seminal trip of Abraham's life, where he travels with Isaac and two other lads to bring him up as a sacrifice on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem, it says the exact same words. Abraham arose in the morning and he saddled his donkey. And this shows us two things. Number one, that there was excitement to wake up in the morning. Number two, that there was commitment to the mission that Abraham saddled his own donkey. Abraham had hundreds of servants. He had a huge household. And of course, it's not appropriate, you would think, for someone like Abraham to saddle his own donkey. And similarly, Bilaam is really rich. And what does he do? He wakes up in the morning. And he himself saddled his female donkey. And the Talmud tells us that this shows us that love corrupts the correct order and hate also corrupts the correct order. Abraham was motivated by love, love of God, to commit this mitzvah of sacrificing Isaac, and he was so excited, he woke up early and he harnessed his donkey himself. And of course, that's corrupting the order. Abraham should have outsourced that to someone else. But he was so enraptured, so in love with God, he did it himself. Similarly, but on the exact opposite side, Bilaam should have allowed someone else to saddle his donkey, but he was so consumed and so motivated by hatred that that too corrupted the natural or the correct order, and he saddled his own donkey. And Rashi tells us that it's almost as if Abraham is the prophylactic against Bilaam. You think that your dedication to curse the Jewish people will be successful? You should realize, our sages tell us, that Abraham preceded you He woke up early, he saddled his his own donkey, and his commitment to do the will of God will be able to shield the Jewish people from allowing your curses to injure and impact them negatively. So Bilaam is traveling with his she-donkey. Now, the, the gender of the donkey comes into importance a little bit later on, and we find out from our sages and quoted 
by the commentaries here on the Parsha that Bilaam's relationship with his donkey was more than just a one of transportation. He, in fact, was someone who was romantically involved with his donkey. But he's traveling, and God's wrath flares up against him, and an angel of God stood on the road to impede him. This is a very interesting, very unusual episode here in the story that Bilaam is traveling. He's traveling with the elders of the... Moabites, and we're also told that he's riding his she donkey and he has two young men with him. And again, this hints at the story of Abraham. Abraham also, the exact same words appear in Genesis, where Abraham is traveling with two young lads to go bring Isaac as a sacrifice. And here, Bilaam is traveling with two young lads to go bring a curse upon the Jewish people. Abraham's traveling on a donkey. Bilaam is also traveling on a female donkey, and that relationship is going to be fleshed out a little bit more later on, but there's an angel standing on the road to impede Bilaam. Rashi tells us that this is an angel of mercy to prevent him from sinning so that he should not sin and he should not be destroyed. Even after the Almighty acquiesced to allow Bilaam to choose his own path, to choose the path of trying to curse the Jewish people, which will not end up well for Bilaam, Still, he provided the possibility of Bilaam being extricated from this sin. This shows us that the mercy of God extends even after people have made the decision to commit a sin, the mercy of God is still present. So the angel is stopping or standing in the road to stop this trip and the donkey sees the angel. And the angel has a sword in his hand. So the donkey turns away from the road and goes into the field. And Bilaam, who does not see the angel yet, he has this recalcitrant donkey and tries to hit it to go back on the road. And the angel stands in the path in the vineyards with a fence on one side and a fence on the other side. And the angel appears to the donkey and the donkey is freaking out and it begins to press against the wall, and it presses Bilaam's leg against the wall, and he continues to hit it. And finally, the angel went further and stood in a very narrow place. There's no room to go right nor left. And the donkey saw the angel of, of God. Again, it's invisible to Bilaam, and it begins to crouch beneath Bilaam, and Bilaam continues with his anger to strike the donkey with his stick. Very unusual description over here. And Rashi tells us, quoting the Midrash, that the three different impediments, where it goes off the road, and then there's a fence on one side, a fence on the other side, and then there's no place to go, that is emblematic, that is symbolizing Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. How so? Abraham, many nations emerged from him. And you also have, of course, Ishmael and Esau. And that is almost like an expansive way that the donkey, so to speak, could evade the angel and to go into the field. And then you have Isaac. Isaac has only two sons. And that is equivalent to almost the fence on one side and fence on the other side. And there's still a little bit of wiggle room because on one side there's Jacob, who of course is righteous. On the other side, there is Asa, who, of course, is wicked. And finally, the angel stands on a place that's so narrow, there's no wiggle room at all. That is a reference to Jacob, Jacob whose entire bed was righteous. Jacob, who all of his children were tzaddik and were righteous. There was no other nation that emerged from them. That is the kind of the symbolism that is undergirding this third encounter where Bilam has absolutely no room to maneuver He cannot move, not right, not left. There's no way to go. He has been defeated. Checkmate. And he continues to hit his donkey. And then something even more unusual happens. Hashem opened the mouth of the donkey. And it said to Bilaam. So we have a talking donkey in our parsha. What have I done to you that you struck me these three times? And Bilaam responds, because you mocked me. If there was a sword in my hand, I would have killed you. And the donkey responds back to Bilaam, a whole unusual dialogue here. 
I'm your she donkey. You have ridden upon me your whole life until this day. Did I ever do this to you? And he responded, and he said, no. And finally, Hashem uncovered Bilaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of God standing on the road with a sword drawn, and he bowed, he prostrated himself to the floor, and now he pivots to having a conversation with the angel. So again, this is a very, very unusual episode here. We have the donkey that begins to speak to Bilaam. So of course, there is voluminous commentaries on, on this whole episode, and we're only scratching the surface, but maybe an idea that we could share is that a donkey in Jewish literature, in Jewish philosophy, it represents physicality. In the Hebrew word for physicality, and materialism is the same root or the same Hebraic root as the word of donkey. Physicality is chomer, and a donkey is chamor. And we're told in Jewish literature that Moses and Abraham and in the future Messiah are going to be riding on top of the donkey. And of course, the Midrash goes on to tell us that the same donkey that Abraham rode to Mount Moriah to bring Isaac as a sacrifice is the exact same donkey that Moses rode to Egypt to go save the Jewish people and is the same donkey that Messiah will ride in the future to go save the Jewish people and to usher in the third commonwealth and the third temple. A very unusual idea. But the meaning behind it, or the basic meaning behind that, is that the donkey represents physicality. When someone rides the donkey, they have the reins, they have the control, and that symbolizes that there is a certain dominance of the soul, so to speak. The soul of Abraham, of Moses, of Messiah, is in total control of their own physicality. And that enables them to have the ability to influence, the ability to guide the Jewish people to their destiny. Bilaam, he's someone who is also riding the donkey. But his relationship is a little bit more intimate with the donkey. He does have the ability, so to speak, to ride on it, but due to his decisions, the donkey becomes smarter than him. He is not on top of the donkey. The donkey is almost on top of him. It asserts control over him. It sees the angel. He doesn't. It communicates with him. We're told, of course, that he copulates with the donkey as well. He's not someone who, even though he had the ability to be like Moses, to ride on the donkey exclusively, he's someone that has descended, that has lowered himself to be on par and even below that donkey. So that's a basic idea that we see over here. The Ramban, he tells us that the reason why there was this miracle, the speaking donkey, is to show Bilaam that the Almighty determines who speaks and what they say. And so to Bilaam, his speech, his speech that he's setting out to go deliver now, is going to be determined by God as well. Now, it is interesting that the verse tells us that when Bilaam sees the angel, God uncovered Bilaam's eyes and he saw the angel. And I think this shows us the architecture of prophecy. It's almost as if the angel is present. Bilaam is just totally unaware of its existence. His eyes were covered. And then you remove the blockades. You uncover his eyes and right away he sees what was there all along. Similarly, We believe that prophecy, the ability to have communication with God, is present. The blockades are on our eyes, really on our eyes and our hearts, our souls. It's covered, but if you scrape away the blockages that impede our greatness, we will be restored to the state that really is the more natural state, the communication with God, the living like an angel, seeing the angel, so to speak, to to be elevated to the higher level. It's not to achieve, to unlock something that was previously unobtainable, it's to remove the impediments. And the fact that the angel is holding the sword, or the commentaries tell us that this is foreshadowing that Bilaam will be killed with a sword very soon. So the angel tells Bilaam, why did you strike your female donkey three times? I went to impede it. You hastened on the road to oppose me. The donkey saw me, turned away. Had it not turned away from me, I would have now even have you killed and let it live. This is a very interesting first statement from the angel to Bilaam. 
Now, Rashi tells us something very fascinating. I think a very, very deep idea that we see several places throughout the Torah. The angel tells Bilam, I would have killed you and let it live. But ultimately, Bilam lived and the donkey died. So what the angel is saying, I should have killed you and let it live, but in effect, I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to let you live and I'm going to kill it. And the reason why is because Bilam was one-upped by his donkey. He wasn't able to respond to its rebuke. And therefore, to prevent Bilam from being ashamed, the Almighty killed the donkey. It's a very powerful idea. Even someone as sinful, as egregious as Bilam, when the Torah punishes him, it does not punish him more than necessary. Yes, he needs to get punished. Yes, he's going to get executed. But the fact that there's a donkey that's walking around, the donkey that silenced Bilam, that is too much. And therefore, that donkey has to be killed. Very powerful idea that even when someone is a sinner and is worthy, deserving of punishment, the Torah does not punish more than is absolutely necessary. So the angel continues the conversation with Bilam. I have sinned. Should I go back? No. The angel says, no, go there. Go with the officers, but do exactly as I tell you. So finally, Balak hears that Bilam is arriving. He goes to meet him and uh, he says to him, why, why didn't you come earlier? And Bilam says, well, I'm here now. And they begin their pursuit of cursing the Jewish people. And they slaughter sacrifices and they go to the mountaintop and they see the edge of the people. This is another idea here. We said that Bilaam is characterized as someone who has an evil eye. And here we see he has to see the people. Abraham was someone who always saw the good in people. Abraham saw the travelers and tried to do kindness with them. And here we see, and the Rabban elaborates on this idea, that Bilaam wants to see them and that will fuel his hatred for the Jewish people and enable him to, to curse them. That's the evil eye of Bilaam. It's the opposite of Abraham. Abraham sees someone and says, how can I help them? Bilaam sees someone and says, how can I exploit them? How can I curse them? And of course, another major difference between Abraham and Bilaam is that Bilaam is going to begin his process now in chapter 23 to try to pray to destroy a nation that's righteous. And of course, Abraham, he was the one who prayed, but not to destroy the righteous, the exact opposite, to save, to spare the wicked of Sodom and Gomorrah. So chapter 23 begins, Bilaam said to Balak, build for me seven altars and seven bulls and seven rams. In order to facilitate his curse, he needs to have seven altars. Why does he need to have seven altars? So there's a few different explanations given by the commentaries. For one, we're told that there are seven righteous builders of altars, and therefore, in order to counteract them, to thwart them, you have to have seven altars to counteract them. Adam, Abel, Noah, Abram, Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses, that's seven righteous people that built altars, and therefore we have to have seven altars to counteract them. Alternatively, there were seven altars built by Abram, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham built four, Isaac built one, and Jacob built two. So the seven altars built by Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, by the founders of the Jewish people. And if you want to uproot the Jewish people, you have to uproot them from their roots, from their foundations. And the foundations, of course, are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And therefore, you have to attack them thusly. So Balak does as Bilaam has requested. There's seven altars. Each altar, a sacrifice of a bull and a ram is offered. And Bilaam tells Balak, okay, now you go stand by the, by the, by the sacrifice and I'm going to go talk to God and whatever God says, tells me to say, I'm going to say. And the Talmud tells us that really this was a miracle because Bilaam knew the exact moment that God was susceptible to cursing, i.e. to cursing the Jewish people. And for those days, God temporarily seized having that moment of anger, the moment of agreeableness to cursing, and therefore Bilaam did not find an opening. Of course, this is a very advanced idea. What does it mean that God for a moment, for a second, for a millisecond is is capable of being 
urge to curse. It's a very interesting theological idea, but that's the basic idea that our, that our sages tell us in the Talmud. And God tells Bilam, okay, I have a message for you. Go say this message. And this begins the blessings of Bilam. He's going to try to curse them, and God's going to turn it on its head and force him to bless the people in the exact way that he wanted to curse them. He wanted to curse them in, in specific ways, and we'll see them not by the curses, but by the opposite. There are blessings that were the exact opposite of the curses that were intended. And it's interesting that a lot of these blessings became part of of literature, part of our liturgy. In fact, in the morning, we say some prayers that come from Bilaam, because Bilaam, he epitomized the nation. He was able to describe and identify the characteristics of our nation for the positive. In fact, the Talmud even says that there was a decision, or at least there was a discussion, whether to include Bilaam's blessings in the daily Shema, ultimately, because we didn't want to encumber the people. It was not included, but it could have been. It was that good. So he begins his first blessing from Aram, Bala, king of Moab, led me to the mountains of the east, and they're, they're very poetic and very beautiful. Balak wants me to curse the Jewish people. How can I curse them? God is not cursed. How can I anger? God is not angry. Again, that's the idea that God did not get angry during these days. From its origins, I see it rock-like. And from the hills do I see it. Behold, is a nation that will dwell in solitude and not be reckoned among the nations. It actually tells us what does it mean that Bilaam is describing its origins. He's talking about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I want to uproot them, but their origins are very strong. A nation that will dwell in solitude. And that, of course, has been true throughout our history, that we're different, we're isolated, we're in solitude, we're not reckoned amongst the nations, and that could be one way or the other. If we try to assimilate, if we try to acculturate, if we try to be any nation like the nations, that necessarily will awaken what we call anti-Semitism, which, according to Jewish philosophy, is the irrational hatred that God implanted to ensure that this remains true, that we're a nation that will dwell in solitude, we're a nation that will not be taken off chart, off our path of bringing the world to its completion, of completing the mission of Abraham, who has counted the dust of Jacob or numbered a quarter of Israel. May my soul die the death of the upright and may my end be like this. Bilaam is so consumed with all the Jewish people, he's hoping to die the death of the righteous. And of course, this does not sound like what Balak had signed up for. He says, I don't get it. I called you to curse them and now you brought a blessing to them. So Bilaam responds, well, this is what I told you. Whatever God tells me to say, I'm going to have to say. So instead, they make a decision to change locations. We're going to go to a different location. We'll see a different part of the nation. Maybe that will allow us to find an opening to go curse the Jewish people. Now, it's interesting. When Abraham prayed, and he was also rebuffed, his prayer to save the people of Simon Gomorrah was unsuccessful. It's clear if you compare the verses that Abraham returned to the same place. And here, Bilaam is unsuccessful and he goes to a different place. And what that tells us is that Abraham attributed his failed prayer to the merits, whereas Bilaam attributed it to the place. There was all kinds of circumstances. It's the place, it's the location, maybe a different angle, and maybe then it'll be war. Maybe then it'll, it will work. Maybe then my cursing will be effective. He blames the circumstances, whereas Abraham blames himself. And again, they go to a different location. Again, they bring sacrifices. Again, Bilaam gives another blessing and he tells him, God is not a man that he should be deceitful, nor a son of man that he should relent. Would he say not do or speak and not confirm? You want to kill the Jewish people. You want to destroy the Jewish people. But he promised that he's going to give them the land of the seven nations. He's going to give them the land of Canaan. How could you possibly even conceive to try to kill them in the wilderness. Behold, to bless I have received. He has blessed and I shall not contradict it. God wants me to bless. I, I can't do anything about it. There's no iniquity in Jacob. There's no perversity in Israel. Hashem, his God, is with him and the friendship of the king is in him. Even when the Jewish people do sin, 
it does not register or certainly does not diminish their stature that we have with God. It is God who brought them out of the land of Egypt according to the power of his loftiness. There is no divination in Jacob. There's no sorcery in Israel. They have a direct connection to God, the Jewish people. They have real prophets. Even if they don't have real prophets, they have the Urim and the Tumim. They have a direct link to God via the prophets, and therefore they don't need to resort to gurus, to sorcerers, and to necromancers. Behold, the people will rise like a lion cub and raise itself like a lion. It will not lie down until it consumes its prey and drinks the blood of the slain. Again, a monumental blessing. And of course, Balak is further disappointed. And they, of course, continue to go to a different place, a third place. Maybe then they will be successful in cursing and attacking the Jewish people. So chapter 24 begins again with a third blessing that is foisted upon Bilaam by God. Bilaam raised his eyes and saw Israel dwelling according to its tribes. Our sages tell us what that means is that each opening of the tent was facing away from a different opening. Everyone was living modestly. That's one of the hallmarks of our nation. It's our path to salvation. The reason why we survive, or one of the reasons why we survived the curses of Bilaam was because of this. The Spirit of God was upon him. He began Again, with a very poetic, a very beautiful, a very stirring blessing. This is the words of Bilaam, the man with the open eye. Or say, just tell us that he was blind in one eye. How goodly are your tents, O Jacob, your dwelling places, O Israel, stretching out like brooks, like gardens by the river, like aloes planted by Hashem, like cedars by water. Again, very beautiful, very poetic, very stirring Water shall flow from his well. And by the way, the commentators, of course, tell us what, what it all means, what the deeper insight behind it. And his seed shall be by abundant waters. His king shall be exalted over our God and his kingdom shall be upraised. And of course, it continues again and again. Balak is beside himself. He claps his hands together. I didn't summon you here to bless them. I, I brought you here to curse them. And now leave you wanted honor. You're not going to get any honor. It's been withheld from you. And again, Billam responded, there's nothing I could do. I told you ahead of time that I am totally beholden to the will of God. Whatever he tells me to say, I must say. And then Billam gives a fourth prophecy, a fourth blessing, which is also hinting at his advice. Rashi tells us, that when it says in verse 14, and now behold, I go to my people, come, I shall advise you what this people will do to your people in the end of days. It's also hinting at the fact that Bilaam gave advice to Balak as to how to attack the Jewish people, not via cursing, but via trying to seduce their men to sin. I know, says Bilaam, that the God of these people hates Immodesty hates promiscuity, and therefore, if you convince the daughters of Moab to avail themselves to the men of the Jewish people, then you will find a way to attack them. And he continues with his fourth prophecy, the words of the one who hears the sayings of God and knows the knowledge of the Supreme One. Again, he's touting his own greatness. Who sees the vision of, of Shakai while fallen and with uncovered eyes. I shall see him, but not now. I shall look at him, but he is not near. A star has issued from Jacob and a scepter bearer has risen from Israel. This is a reference to David, to Solomon, to Messiah. And he shall pierce the nobles of Moab and undermine all the children of Seth. And the Ramban, he encapsulates the blessings and the prophecies of Bilaam. The first prophecy was a reference to the past, to the great and holy patriarchs of the Jewish people. The second prophecy was on the present. The third was on the future, the days of David and, and Solomon. And the fourth and final blessing, the fourth and final prophecy was in the yet-to-come future, the future where the destiny of Abraham is fulfilled. So Bilaam gets up, he goes back to his place, and Balak also returns to his place. That's the end of chapter 24, and chapter 25 begins with a 
fulfillment of Bilaam's plot, like we said, that he gave them the suggestion to commit the daughters of Moab into harlotry and to use that as a means to attack the Jewish people. Israel settled in Shittim and the people began to commit harlotry with the daughters of Moab. They invited people to the feast of their gods. The people ate and prostrated themselves to their gods. Israel became attached to Baal Peor, which is the, the idol, and the wrath of Hashem flared up against the Jewish people. Now, our sages tell us, what does it mean that the idol is called Baal Peor? What it means is, is that the means of servicing it, the means of worshiping it, was by defecating in front of it. That was the way that they did this idolatry. And the meaning behind that is that this idolatry represented nihilism. It represented the concept that nothing matters. We're all eventually like refuse, like waste. We have no life, no value, no continuity. It's all ending up as compost. We're just going to decompose. We're just like the, the defecant that we have no value. That's the idea behind this idolatry. And therefore, of course, if you have no life, if you have no eternity, if you have no soul, then everything that you do should be just to maximize your own personal and carnal pleasure in this world. And of course, we believe that the exact opposite is true. Everything has value. Everything has continuity. And by the way, even the fertilizer is used from the refuse, from the waste that is produced. Nothing is for naught. And what do the people do? What do the Moabite women do? They give them to eat. It's interesting. They give them to eat and they prostrate themselves. And an interesting idea. We know that the Jewish people at the time were still eating manna. Manna does not produce anything that must be defecated. And therefore, the only way to get the Jewish people to do this form of idolatry was if they ate regular food with the Moabites and that made this form of idolatry possible. So the nation became attached to Baal Peor and God's anger flared against them and a plague began killing members of the Jewish people. And Moses tries to intervene. Go try to prevent this plague from continuing by executing all the people that were attached to Baal Peor and Amidst this entire plague, something very unusual happens, and the leader of the tribe of Shimon, he seizes a Moabite princess, and he brings her to Moses. Behold, a man of the children of Israel came and brought a midnight woman near to his brothers in the sight of Moses and in the sight of the entire assembly of the children of Israel, and they were weeping at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Zimri, the name of this head of the tribe, he grabs this Moabite woman and he comes to Moses and asks, is this woman allowed or is she not allowed? And of course he says she's not allowed. And he says to them, okay, well, what difference exists between this woman, this Moabite princess, and the Midianite woman, the daughter of Jethro, that you married? And the answer, of course, is, is that Moses married her before Sinai. This is already after Sinai. But regardless, this shows the state of the nation after they capitulated to the Moabite women and their seductions. And this man, Zimri, he begins in a very public fashion to copulate with this Moabite princess. And the nation is crying, and there's various reasons given here why they were crying. One of the reasons is, is that no one knew what to do. And amidst this terrible state, Pinchas, the son of Lazar, the son of Aaron, the Kohen, this is the grandson of Aaron, he saw what happened and he remembered the law that when someone is behaving in such a fashion, a very public way, they are vulnerable to being extrajudicially executed. He stood up from among the assembly, he took a spear in his hand and he followed the Israelite man into the plant, into the tent and he pierced them both. He made a skewer out of Zimri and Cosby, these were the people that were doing the sin, and the plague was halted. But 24,000 people died in that plague. It's a very unusual way to end the parsha. The zealotry of Pinchas, the grandson of Aaron, 
the reason why he's attributed to Aaron is because Aaron, of course, was the paragon of love, of fellow man, of kindness, of bringing them close to Torah, and yet someone like Pinchas is justifiably the descendant of, of Aaron because he was the one who, notwithstanding his love of his fellow man, was motivated by zealotry of his love of God to stop this madness and to execute both Zimri, the Jew, the head of the tribe of Shimon, and Cusby, the Moabite princess, and to go kill them in order to stave off or to stop the plague and to restore order and restore the will of God. And of course, Natchez's Parsha continues with this narrative. The Parsha is called Pinchas, named, of course, after Pinchas, and the ramifications of his act of martyrdom. Thank you so much for listening. My name is Rabbi Yaakov Walby from Torch in Houston, Texas. The email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com. I look forward to speaking to you next week.